Okay, we've got some folks filtering in. We're just gonna wait about a minute or so just to let folks join. And then, and then we'll start in. Sounds good. <clears throat> yeah, and for those of us just, uh, those of you just joining us, we're just letting uh, some folks join. Uh, we're going to wait about another 30 seconds and then and then we'll start. Yeah, and just to reiterate what uh, what Josh just put in the chat is go ahead, if you have any questions, go ahead and use the Q&A uh, bu button at the bottom of your screen, and, uh, and we will get to those questions uh, as we can. And we're just going to start off. Uh, welcome to the podcasting, uh, the is, is It the Voice of Fantasy panel. And uh, I'm Michael Haspel. I'll be the moderator today. And uh, first things off, you know, since uh, podcasting, it's almost like a democratization of content generation, since everyone can kind of make it. Uh, do we want, let's go around and just you guys can tell me about your podcast and how you got started and what it's about. And uh, I guess we'll start with uh, Thaddeus. My name is Thaddeus House. I am a speculative fiction. Oh, you just got muted. Sorry. I, I'm a speculative fiction writer, and I write a host of science fiction of all kinds. Uh, my podcast currently is a climate change podcast, but the reason I do a climate change podcast is because I believe ultimately the real challenge for climate change isn't about just the phenomena, but how we talk about it. And one of the reasons we get together and talk is to try and help people craft narratives that help them get help people get past the narrative, the, the, psychological limitations that talking about climate change seems to cause people become unable to focus on it because it's just too large. So by talking about it in story form, we try to make it more approachable, more usable, more friendly, and more effective. Cool. Um, Mackenzie, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Mackenzie Kira, and I'm the uh, the other half of Ladies of the Fright. I've got Lisa Quigley over here, who is the co-host. And I'm actually going to um, sort of defer over to her. She does this part so much better than I <laughs> ever could. <laughs> uh, like Mackenzie said, I'm Lisa Quigley. We are the hosts of the Ladies of the Fright podcast, which is a horror podcast where we interview authors, editors, uh, librarians, different industry professionals, and talk about the writing process. Um, as well as uh, horror literature and the kind of like horror climate today. Um, and yeah, we use our podcast as a platform to support all kinds of voices um, and as well as indie podcast, uh, sorry, indie authors as well as um, traditionally published authors. And um, we started it as a just something we wanted to do together. It was our collaborative project. We, it was something we could do from, I live in New Jersey, she lives in California, something we could do remotely. And um, we didn't really know what would come of it. It was just something we wanted to share. And then um, somehow we ended up winning This Is Horror Award, um, nonfiction podcast of the year twice in a row. So mm -hmm. 2018 <laughs> and 2019. So. Congratulations. That's Thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so that's me and Mackenzie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary, you want to round it out? Uh, yeah. My name is Gary Wolf. I'm a critic and scholar and reviewer of science fiction. And uh, for 10 years now, I've been doing the Cood Street podcast with Jonathan Strawn. Uh, which began um, kind of very informally. I mean, basically, uh, the, the guy who edited the magazine I write my monthly column for, Locus Magazine, Charlie Brown, died about 10 years ago. And both Jonathan and I discovered that we had been having fierce arguments about science fiction with Charlie. 
which made you sort of sharpen your own arguments and your own view of science fiction. And so Jonathan and I started talking to each other about once a week. And at one point he said, why don't we just start recording these and, and, and putting them out there? So we did. Same kind of thing that you were talking about, Lisa and, and Mackenzie. Um, and, and we ended up uh, a couple of years later getting a, a Hugo nomination. I think we've got six or seven since wow. then. Um, we, I don't know, we, we've never won a Hugo. We've been nominated for Dick Mars and Hugo's because Jonathan's in Australia. It's also a challenge to do a podcast between Chicago and Perth, Australia, where there's a 13 hour time difference, which gets even more complicated if we have a guest in the UK, because then I'm getting up at eight in the morning to talk to somebody who's at two in the afternoon in London to talk to Jonathan, who's at nine at night in Perth. Um, so the logistics is, uh, is kind of challenging, but basically it's just a lot of fun. We have guests sometimes this past summer from March through the beginning of um, October, we insanely set out to do uh, a podcast every day talking with different uh, people about what they were uh, reading and, and writing. And uh, that turned out to be uh, pretty popular as well. Although, it, like I say, it was an insane thing to do. And so we kind of backed off on that a little bit. <laughs> back to our weekly schedule mostly yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna defer to some of my uh kind of pre-canned questions here uh and it seems like uh uh thaddeus you do a solo podcast right and it's it's not solo i have oh uh, i do a live cast so i have a a co-host who i i Okay, I'm the showrunner. I'm the primary reach researcher. So when I do my show, I usually have a topic of the day. I do the research for it, and then I share that topic with my co-host, who does other research. She usually helps with other perspectives on the show, and then we do the show with a live studio audience. So they wow. very often want to have uh, either want to have a moment, or they want to ask questions, and they want a live answer. So I have to actually try and answer those questions live. And, and sometimes it's great and sometimes it's challenging. Um, so it's not like a traditional podcast and where I'm just talking. I mean, I've done those, uh, you know, I've done a podcast where I just talk for an, a half an hour, an hour, and that's great. But this thing is, it's a live cast. So it has a, it has a slightly different rhythm. And so my co-host, she supports, and I do the hard, the hard dance of trying to make climate change reasonable, understandable, uh, and talking about all the things that relate to it, because climate change isn't just about climate change. It's about a whole bunch of other topics. So mm -hmm. we end up having a, a rainbow of things that we cover. And we've been doing it for a couple of years, once a week for like two years now. So we've covered hundreds of topics and they're all, and it's funny to me because now when I listen to the news, many things that we were talking about two years ago where no one was talking about them, now they're showing up and it's like, oh, finally, I'm starting to feel like <laughs> what I'm talking about is starting to become an issue to other people. And it took, like I said, two years of doing this every week for it, for me to be able to start seeing other news play, newspapers and, and media services. Now they're starting their own climate sections and a couple have started their own climate podcasts. And so that's been interesting uh, to watch that evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, it's uh, I, the reason I was asking that is, uh, has, has anybody else done like the solo podcast thing? Um, yeah, I, I do. My quantum fraud dispatches is a solo podcast and it can get, uh, I I'm on two different podcasts. One's quantum fraud dispatches where I do film and story analysis and author interviews and stuff. But, uh, the other one is a group podcast about wargaming. And it's far easier to do the group podcast. So I just wanted to kind of touch on, you know, how to how to just keep going if if you were doing solo. Um, what and this goes out to everybody. What do you think would be the ideal length for a podcast? Um, um, the ideal length for a podcast, and we're talking about not just doing it solo, but with two people, right? Yes. Yes, okay. like a okay. standard, your standard podcast. What, what would you consider the ideal length? Um, Lisa and I, just because we're both um, 
new moms and we also work full time, we kind of tapped our podcast at like the perfect place for us at around between like 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Now, that being said, we've actually been on podcasts where they'll run for three to four hours, basically, however long someone wants to talk about something. Um, and I can definitely see that that working for the right platform. And so I think that if we're speaking to people who are going to be new at podcasting, I would say keeping it to an hour might be that sweet spot, mm -hmm. but I can see it working for different, uh, at different lengths for different things, for sure. Mm -hmm. I also think that you have to consider the listener attention span too. So an hour seems to be for us that kind of sweet spot of, you know, how, how long somebody's going to actually listen to your episode um like Mackenzie said a lot of times we will go on like we've been on this is horror a couple of times and they do a lot of times have like three to four hour conversations but then they usually split them up between two or three episodes um just because you know a three or four hour episode is pretty daunting for a listener yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's that's kind of how we look at it one of the things we discovered after um, recording the podcast for a couple of years and then would show up at something like like a world fantasy convention or a world con and people who had not met us would would suddenly see who we are and, and i learned from them that the podcast should be about the length of their commute mm -hmm. or the 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 length of their workout in other words people tend to listen to podcasts when they're driving to work when they're on the bus when they're at the gym and those tend to run between, you know, those time periods tend to run between 45 minutes and an hour and 15 minutes. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, and, and my own experience is pretty much similar. I don't really, uh, if, if I get into a podcast, there's one I like to listen to occasionally, and it sometimes runs on for two and three hours. And I don't have two and three hour chunks of time to, to devote to it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think considering the commute is a is a really important thing because that's generally when I listen, not now because I don't, you know, nobody <laughs> well, I'm working from home, but, but I don't listen to podcasts when I'm sitting around. It's when I'm walking or um, cleaning around the house or, you know, doing things that I need to get taken care of. It's like something to do while I'm doing those things. So um, yeah, I think considering the fact that it's either going to be a commute or a, a walk or mm -hmm. a run or some kind of mm -hmm. activity. Uh, considering that when you're thinking of length. I consider it meditative noise. Yes. So, <laughs> no, really. That's yeah. that's how I look at a podcast. It's meditative yeah. noise. It's something you mm -hmm. can do when you're doing something else, yep. but you don't want to talk to anybody, but you don't want to listen to the radio per se, because it's not usually talking about something you're interested in. So the podcast gets to be that sweet spot of something I can do that's talking about something that I like, that's happening for 30 minutes to an hour mm -hmm. and I can do it without having to focus my attention on it because I kind of like it already. So I kind of know about it. So they're just, we're, we're almost like a conversation that I'm almost not having to participate in. I'm just listening and going, yeah, I agree with that. Or, or I don't agree with that. And I'll send them a letter as soon as I'm done. <laughs> and that that's why I call it meditative noise because sometimes you can get into it and be really involved. And other times you're just kind of cruising with it and riding with it. So if it's an hour, that's an hour I spend either cleaning my house or mm -hmm. working in my yard or dealing with my, you know, uh, mundane chores. And so it's much easier to do that uh, if I'm not wanting to hear nothing but silence or meditation, which right. sometimes I do. Right. So that's why I use it that way. Uh, I and love that. <laughs> And it's not a book either. It's a lot more, it's a lot easier too. I feel like to just tune into a, a, uh, an episode of a podcast real quick, like something that you really want to listen to, like what you were saying, Thaddeus, as opposed to saying, okay, well, I don't really quite remember what chapter I was on because I was busy doing a chore and I got sidetracked and I had to put it on pause. Like, no, the podcast definitely allows a sense of um, a little bit more freedom, I think, than having to be completely in like listening to a book, if you're going to listen to something. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I read once there's actually a, a book by an audio theorist about why, why soap operas became so popular on television at the half hour length. And it's pretty much exactly what we've been saying. The soap opera is essentially a radio form. I mean, basically, if you watch them on television, you're not seeing much except people talking to each other. That was deliberate because soap operas were designed for people to be doing chores around the house and being able to listen to them. And the plots became so... Uh, immobile, I guess, that you could listen a couple of days a week and pick up, you know, three weeks later and nothing had changed. The characters were the same characters and they'd moved like six inches during that period. 
and to some extent, I think the podcast has that same appeal. It's, it's kind of like what you were saying, Thaddeus. It, it doesn't demand your complete attention, but it catches your attention every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so as a segue to that, uh, there are podcasts out there that um, that use that that actually use fiction uh, to they, they're using they're using the podcast form to get their fiction out in front of people and everything like that. Have have any of you ever done anything like that? I haven't. We haven't done it, um, but I there's a couple that I listen to. Like I know there's the No Sleep podcast, which is a horror a short horror fiction podcast, um, and Oh, there's a couple other pseudopod, I think is one. I, um, but yeah, and they're just a really unique way. I think that short fiction is being published now, uh, kind of capitalizing on both the audio storytelling as well as the um, podcast format. So I think it's an interesting thing, but I've never, we've never actually produced a short story or anything on our show. <laughs> oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that is. So I read, uh, my, like, for, I'm a writer. I write speculative fiction. I write short fiction, uh, flash fiction, uh, you know, anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 words. So that, to me, I find that to be a really good form for reading into a podcast or, like, I, 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 I visit several podcasts, and um, I haven't done mine as a podcast i've done it as part of a performance mm -hmm. so when i worked with the the san francisco public library when they were open we came up there and we read me and a group of other writers we read our stuff and it became an hour and a half podcast where we basically put it online we read our stories and you can now go see them and so when i started doing that i realized that it could be used this way and there are writers who are doing it uh tad williams uh, famous Tad Williams. He um, he does a reading every Sunday night, twice a day. Once in the morning for his morning crew on the morning side of the world, and then another one at two a.m. for people in the evening side of the world. And so he gets up on Sunday to read one of his stories, either from one of his books or one of his short stories. And so he is hardcore dedicated, and he's basically been doing this since probably about. June, maybe May, June. And, you know, I catch them when I catch them. But as long as, you know, if I'm awake that time, I have it notified, it, it can notify me. So I know when he shows up and it's like, oh, I'm not doing anything. Let's listen to Tad. So I know there are writers who are doing it. I had planned to do it because I've been reading with mine in all these different readings. And I'm like, well, you know, I have enough short stories that will probably never actually be printed, printed, that I could read them this way. And, and they become part of the the sphere of existence and they're good stories because people like them. I just don't feel like being bothered with trying to publish them and having to go through so much song and so much dance. Sometimes I feel like the publishing industry is intentionally difficult and I'm like, I don't have time for that. <laughs> so for me, if I read my story, it's out there. If people like it, great. And if they don't, well, they, you may really like the next one. And so I've been working on a means of putting them out in that format. So my wife and I have been talking about that. And so we started experimenting with streaming and doing that. And that's been really good. So hopefully mm -hmm. we'll make something work like that. Yeah, excellent. And I want to give a quick plug out. And the the uh, Lisa and Mackenzie, you may be aware of this, but uh, the BBC did an outstanding podcast series based on the case of Charles Dexter Ward by H.P. Lovecraft. And they did it uh as as if they were a true crime podcast and and it's happening in modern day so if you have not heard of that go check it out because it is fantastically done and it's all updated so that it's not taking place in the 1920s <laughs> taking place in modern day but they did a, a really really good job with that um and and Thaddeus brought up uh, something that I want to talk about. Have have you guys experimented with Twitch or YouTube, where you simulcast your your uh, podcast on that on those platforms at the same time? Because um, when we do the Long War, which is our war gaming podcast, we actually do it on YouTube and Twitch at the same time, and we're interacting with the chat uh, live. So. It, it adds a, a different measure like Thaddeus was talking about, but I think you were saying you had live people in the studio. 
Yeah. So when I do the, the live cast, I have an audience. And so that's been interesting because uh, when I used to do just a podcast it was me and a woman named Denise Newton. We used Sandra Denise Newton. We used to get together and we would do book reviews. She would read a bunch of books. We would get together, talk about those books, talk about the concepts. And so that was just her and I doing a dialogue. And that's actually a really successful form for the podcast. I think that's actually probably the best form where two people interact. And if you get a third person or a guest, then you have three people. And that's the virtuous circle. I love that. But what I have learned is that when I do live casts, um, if you get a regular audience, it actually becomes even more interesting because those regular audience members become almost like cast members. They, they have an opinion, they share their opinion, we interact and it feels good. It, it has a, a strong thing. And when new people come in, it's almost like you're having a studio audience which can't interact with you and they bring really great questions. So that really works well. I, I find that I have never had a problem working live, even though I, I hear people tell me, oh, live is the worst. I'm like, not for me. So far, live has been the best format because I get to see people and they come in. And yes, sometimes they say crazy things. And yes, sometimes they try to take over the show. But for the most part, it's really a wonderful event. I think everybody should try it at least once. That's why I'm going to try and do Twitch. I, I've been learning how to do uh, Twitch. So I, I now have, I, I did my first stream. For Twitch, <laughs> uh, and I learned that Twitch is actually really hard. And there's a whole bunch of things you have to know that they don't teach you easily. I mean, right now I'm waiting for, I, I figure at the rate I'm going, I'm going to have to write a book about it because anybody over the age of 50 is looking at this going, I want to do this, but I have no idea what it takes. And it takes a little bit of knowledge. It, it does. And so I've been learning it and working with it and I, you know, writing my notes down. So at some point, maybe I'll make a little uh, FAQ for people who want to learn how to do this, but don't have the time to experiment like I have, because that's, it's a challenge, but it, I think it's a great way to do it. Yeah, excellent. Um, we've definitely never, we haven't, I guess, considered is the right word for it. We haven't considered doing a live event like that. Um, it's something that I can see us definitely attempting in the future. Um, Thaddeus makes it sound really, really cool, especially the idea of people coming in just kind of asking questions. I really like that idea, um, especially right now during a pandemic when we just haven't been talking to people as much. Um, and so I can definitely see the draw there. Um, one of our one of our close friends actually started up with the Horror Writers Association doing something kind of like that. She's doing the Skeleton Hour, and um, that's where she brings um, different authors um, and uh, honestly just different professionals in the horror genre together and then they all talk live um, on Facebook and then they also stream it on YouTube and so that's something that they've done in kind of in the wake of this pandemic in response to it because we've just been we've been uh you know kind of uh away from people <laughs> yeah and it's really cool because she does it she hosts it as a, a live zoom webinar yeah but then in I, I think zoom has like a limit to how many people or attendees can be there mm -hmm. at certain pay levels so they also live stream it to the uh, Horror Writers Association's Facebook page yeah. so that they can have that as many people as um, as many participants as they want and they can get that live interaction so she's been doing that I think she's on her third one now um, yeah. so it's kind of like a crossbreed between podcasting webinar and like a live stream type of thing mm -hmm. um, which is really cool and the, obviously the pandemic is horrible and we want it to end as quickly as possible but I do think one um one thing we're kind of going to take moving forward is all these uh, new ways of interacting with our audiences and but remotely remotely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's been a kind of cool thing to come out of it. Mm -hmm. The only time we've tried to do a, a live thing, but actually at a world con uh, three, three or four times, maybe five times now we would we, do a podcast in front of an audience, which was enormous fun. Uh, but again, the problem we have just with the 13 hour time difference between here and Australia is essentially the same problem that World Fantasy is having right now. For somebody, it's going to be three o'clock in the morning. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I've seen uh, uh, like writing excuses uh, has recorded mm -hmm. at, at FanX and at different, uh, at different cons live with, a, with an audience there. And it's, it's interesting to see the, how the dynamic changes a little bit. Um, I'd like to shift a little bit to like folks that want to start their own podcast. And so wanted to get into, um, what advice would you have for, 
people looking to start their own podcast. And uh, Gary, we can start with you. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know since ours practically started by accident. I guess the thing uh, that seems most important when I listen to podcasts that seem to just evaporate after a few episodes is that you need to have something that's sustainable. In other words, you need to have a topic that doesn't wear itself out after um, after, after, after five or six episodes. If you're talking about, let's say, um, oh, you could let's say you want to do a podcast you mentioned Lovecraft and Lovecraft gets discussed a lot um, for good and bad reasons mm -hmm. and if you want to just get Lovecraft if you want to just take look at what Victor Laval has done with Lovecraft and N.K. Jemison and that sort of thing that's an interesting topic but it's about four or five weeks worth of podcasts so if you don't have anything that can go on beyond that then you should probably think in terms of a limited run podcast yeah and I think speaking to that um the sustainability aspect, like you were saying, Gary, I think it needs to be also a, pa a topic that you are personally passionate about and interested in, yeah. not just something you think like, oh, um, I want to do this because I think it would be cool. Or, I mean, you want that too. Obviously, you would want to do something that you're excited about, but you need to have something that you feel personally excited about and passionate about because it is a little bit more work than we you know than people <laughs> think it is <laughs> it's not as easy as just like oh let's record a podcast and that's it um so you have to be willing you have to love what you're doing so much that you're willing to do sort of some of the more mundane things you need to do to start a podcast uh I'll also in terms of sustainability i think it needs to be it doesn't matter if you do every day every other day every week every other week or once a month as long as you're consistent, I think that consistency yeah. is important. And so if all you know you can commit to is once a month, that's better than saying, I'm going to do every week and then burning yourself out. Because then you can know that you can create a once a month show with all your energy and put all your focus into it. And um, the, the listeners will still respond to that. I mean, it's going to be a different type of audience, but still... I, I think that's really important than, than saying like, oh, I want to do every single week, unless you have the kind of energy and time to really commit and devote to that. So I say, um, you know, make sure it's sustainable for what you have in terms of your energy and your time and, um, and start from there. Yeah. And just to kind of piggyback off of what Lisa was saying about all of that, we, when we started it, was very like Lisa and I really thought that we were going to have like maybe three listeners and one of those listeners was going to be my dad um <laughs> and so we just we really didn't it's I don't want to say we didn't have high hopes we were just stalled like solidly excited about having a project that she and I could do together even though she had just moved to New Jersey it's like oh my gosh this really fun thing that we will get to do and it's ours and I think that that mentality is what drove us forward because when we looked in, to see how many listeners we have it astounded us. And that kind of put a little fuel to the um, fuel to the fire too. Um, the idea that, oh my God, we went out and we just wanted to do something fun, something that we would enjoy. Um, other people seemed to enjoy it as well. And so now we're doing it for us and for them. Yeah, and just to quickly add on to that, I would also say, uh, don't have too high of hope. Like, if you're getting into podcasting so that you can get rich and make a lot of money, like, <laughs> turn around. Now. I mean, I know, some, like, maybe for some people that does happen, but I, I think that for us, it was, it was like no expectations. We just, yeah. like you said, genuinely wanted to have these conversations, and the, and like you were saying, Gary, we were already having these conversations, mm -hmm. so we decided to record them, and yeah. then it grew organically by us getting involved in the community. Um, finding other book lovers and other writers that we connected with and that had similar interests and it just grew that way rather than us coming out being like I want to have tens of thousands of listeners you know so um I would say keep keep those expectations you know reasonable allow it to grow naturally oh yeah yeah if you build it they will come <laughs> <laughs> see I had a different problem with podcasting for a long time I was a, uh, I, I used to be, I don't know if you've ever heard of this thing called blog talk radio. Anybody ever heard of it? No. Yeah. Blog talk radio was this thing that happened a decade ago. And basically what it was, was a bunch of people would get together and they would get on a call. It's basically a, a shared phone call and they would get on the phone call and they would talk 
and people would chat with them in the call while the call was going on live. So people would ask questions and the people on the call, usually a group of people, would have this round table and we would talk and we would share ideas. And so I did that 10 years ago. That was a long time. I did that for five years and then I worked with another group of people for another three or four years after that. So when I came to doing, when it came time for me to think about doing my own show, I had a problem with podcasting because I felt that it was a lot like blogging in that it was disposable. Once you've done it, unless someone's willing to put the time into it to hear everything you've written, it basically just disappeared. So for me, I wanted to have more than that. I wanted my blogs, like my written stuff, to have a lifespan beyond that moment. So when I started doing my, my live podcast with uh, Climate Change by the Elements, I started doing a like a showrunner's log. Here's what I want to talk about. Here go the questions I want to cover. Here go some topics or ideas or articles or references for things I want to do so that when I was done, you would still be able to enjoy not just listening to it, but looking through the references that I've created so that you can understand why we talk about the subject in that way. And because I do a, a, an actual science-based podcast, I wanted people to have references they could look up. And so for me, my podcast issue was I wanted it to have sustainability. I didn't want it to be something that unless you listen to an entire show, you had no idea of what we talked about. So that's why I made my show notes. And so I believe doing this is it's for me it's a it's a it's a it's a labor of love i have to love it because there's no way i add an extra three hours of work you know two hours of research another hour of article writing then to get on the show for an hour so the average podcast weekly podcast for me is a four hour uh investment so for, I feel like if you're going to do this, if your goal is to be good, if you're, especially if you're doing a science podcast, you want to do something that's researchable, you definitely want to put that time in and, and make that effort so that even when people don't always listen to the podcast completely, if there's show notes, they have an idea of what went on and they could reference those later. Because, you know, the, the where the world works is every two years, the amount of information in the world doubles. So your podcast will rapidly vanish into the black hole of, you know, technical, technological history pretty quickly. You'll cross that event horizon and just disappear. So unless you make notes that can be searched for or, or found, eventually people will only have one way to deal with your show and that's to listen to it. So if you don't make notes, there's no way anyone's going to ever know what you're doing. So for me, it was important to make notes. Now, if you're doing some other kind of podcast, like if I were doing something on comics, now I'm a comics person. So if I were doing a po comics podcast, I might not make such intense notes because I've already written articles that I can reference. So they might just be included with my show and saying, hey, I'm talking about this topic and I've written about it here. So if you want to know more, go here. Today, we're talking about the Human Torch and the Fantastic Four. There yeah. we go. And that way you can read the article I wrote and if you want to know more, you listen to the podcast, you come away knowing a lot more and everybody's a lot happier. So I'm a firm believer that blogging or video blogging, uh, podcasting is best done if you are able to track it, write it, organize it so that people know why you did it in the future. Because without those notes, no one's going to listen to your show beyond that moment. Okay. Yeah, that's a solid point. And going to that, um, what... Uh, what kind of equipment or what kind of tools would you recommend people who want to start a podcast uh, jump into? Like, because understanding that they're probably going to be on a budget. <laughs> we've uh, we've had a lot of luck with um, Yeti microphones. Um, we use those, and we originally kind of we originally ordered just like some knockoff brand whatever's to have in front of our face and uh one and the director of our mfa program actually like privately messaged us and he was like that won't cut it <laughs> and so we actually tried to kind of go like the cheaper way um and uh it didn't work out and so i would definitely say within reason you know like we didn't right away we didn't splurge for like the best things that you could have we kind of found like a middle ground and we did you know and um lisa looked up the reviews and things like it was, that it was like a hundred dollar get like a decent microphone get a pop filter um yes we didn't have one of those at first and it's horrible it sounds really upsetting <laughs> on the ears <laughs> yeah um uh we did not start off with a libsyn account but we did switch to it after our first year i 
it's a little bit of money, but I recommend it just because it has made things so much easier. We can track all of our, um, you know, downloads and everything. It gives us all of our stats. So we know what's happening and which episodes are performing well. Um, what is this service? It's Libsyn. It's a, it's a podcast hosting uh, service. There's the other similar ones. We just happen to use Libsyn. Um, it's, it's not horribly, I think for like the lowest level of upload. So if you're only going to do like one episode a month, I think it's like maybe $5 a month. And, and this, the level we're at, cause we do two episodes a month is like $11 a month. Um, so it's not outrageously expensive. It's a little cost, but that's been really great for us. Uh, we started off just hosting it on our website, which was on Squarespace because it's included, but it doesn't, it didn't come with any of the stat tracking or anything like that. Um, I would say get it a, some kind of website um, that, so those are the things I would say, have a, have a website that looks nice, a, um, a, some kind of solid hosting service like Podbean or Libsyn or, or one of those and a decent microphone, I would say those are the things you, you really need. And then Audacity is a free service that we use. Uh, uh, I don't know if you call it an app or, or what, but it's what we use to edit the podcast, the audio. So mm -hmm. those are my suggestions personally. <laughs> my suggestion is get a podcast partner who knows all this tech stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we use Podbean and, it, and, and we also have not extensive show notes, but enough when there are yeah. guests on. And, and it is interesting uh, after many years to find that uh, some of the archival episodes still get downloads years later. If they're all there, they're all indexed and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm sure that the podcasts where Jonathan and I are just talking with each other have disappeared. They've gone beyond that event horizon that you talked about, Thaddeus. But we did episodes years ago. We uh, would, would have episodes with Gene Wolfe or Ursula Le Guin or Joe Abercrombie and find out years later, uh, people are still finding them and listening to them. Because of those names. Well, that's well, exactly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, th th those names. That, that's what that's what made the difference for you. Um, that that holds you up in searches. That keeps you visible. Uh, being a new, see, most of my work was done on the phone, so all right. of my podcasting was phone casting. <laughs> so I had the high quality microphone of my you know eight hundred dollar telephone, <laughs> and so I had everything I needed until I started trying to do it in the chair. Now what I did in the chair, then I had to go and get a microphone, a nice microphone. Yeah. That, and that's, get, that is a Yeti too as well, yes. right? It's yeah. a nice microphone. Then you had to go and I had to, I had a camera for years. I had an old a Logitech. And when I started doing uh, vlog or started doing Zooming, I started looking at people's Zoom window and it's like, ooh, that Zoom window is really pretty. Why is mine so fuzzy? So I was like, okay, <laughs> that means it's time for me to upgrade from my C625 to uh, Logitech 922. And it's like, ooh, this is nice. And then I realized now I could see all my house in the 3D color. That's absolutely <laughs> awful. So I had to, <laughs> I had to do a So you can't see into my house because people are yeah. they're looking they're looking over my shoulder going, who are those people on the oh, wall? Yeah, like and I'm mine. like, no, I, don't want, I don't want that. So there we go. Plus, you know, my, my family, my kids, my yeah. cats, they're all walking behind me. And so then it, it was stopping and waving over my shoulders like, no, I don't have a shoji. So I got a shoji. And then I noticed I was so dark and I couldn't see myself. So it's like, okay, now I need lights. So I had to yeah. go get lights. So I have a light here. I got a light here. I'm going to get a light stand for over here. So it's like, you have to slowly do this. You cannot, you yeah. know, I'm poor. I can't afford to do all <laughs> yeah, this at once. Same. So yeah. I got a camera one month. I got a microphone the next month. I got that light the third month. And so, you know, four months later, you could see me, you could hear me and I could actually <laughs> be visible, but that took yeah. time. So, you know, unless you're just rolling with money it takes you know there's a little bit of effort and investment you have to do and that's what that's what i was working on so now i'm good now i'm working on the software part you know where am i going to store my podcast how long are they going to be where will they live uh how long will they live right now most of my stuff is, is stored on soundcloud but soundcloud has no stats no search no nothing so that's useless to me so i need a more dedicated service yeah. so that's probably why i'll be that's why i was asking what yeah. was LibSync or Podbean or yeah. these things yeah. that are now in my list of things to look into today so yes. I can start you know, <laughs> yeah. the 
Yeah, we switched to Libsyn. It was after a year, and I have not regretted it because it, so. yeah, it is it is great. It's very user friendly. It's really easy. Um, and then I have every single stat you could think of. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us any of the download information from before we got Libsyn, but now it tracks anything that's on the feed, even the stuff that we had before we got Libsyn. It's just started the day we got it. So yeah. It's yeah. really cool yeah. to be able to go get that info. And that's also really helpful to have that info because we started to get to the point where we wanted to look for sponsorships. And mm -hmm. you can't do that from the beginning because if you have 10 downloads, nobody cares. But if you have <laughs> thousands of downloads, then they want to advertise yep. on your show. And if you can prove that you have those downloads, that's where the stats come in really. That's why, yeah, that's why stats matter. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. that's yep. exactly the exactly. reason that stats matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, maybe this is a small note too, but it actually made a huge difference for us for a couple of episodes is to not like, I'm sequestered in my office right now from my toddler, but um, generally the sound is about a thousand times better if I'm sitting on the bed with like pillows all around me. I've like made like my own like sound, like sound barrier for some reason, you know? So it's like, I was in here and Lisa was saying like, your sound just still isn't very good. Like, is the pop filter on? Is the mic close enough to you? And so we're playing around, we're playing around. And finally, there's like one day where I just got stuck in the back bed room because you know my child was like crawling throughout the hallway and we just had to be on and she's like oh my god your sound is amazing where are you and I'm like I'm in a pillow fort like <laughs> yeah because it offers that padding for it yeah. from the echoes and stuff mm -hmm. yep Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So sometimes the answer isn't the most expensive one. It's just the most creative. <laughs> How many one. pillows? Can How many stop? pillows? <laughs> right. Yeah. But another uh, another secret for that is uh, if your closet is big enough, your your closet with yeah. yes. with all your suits yes. and, and dresses and everything hanging up because the clothes will absorb the sound. Mm -hmm. And I want to yeah. plug uh, not only Libsyn again because um, that's the service I use. And they will distribute to multiple different platforms, yes. Spotify, YouTube, everything all at once. You just hit publish and it goes everywhere. Uh, it's, it stands for, it's short for liberated syndication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to remember the name Libsyn, that's where it comes from. The other uh, service I would like to plug is uh, Zencaster. And that is if you have multiple podcasters in different places, it's great for doing interviews because what it does is it records the audio on that remote person's computer right? and then uploads it. So you're getting their direct, you're not recording what, what your computer is hearing, you're recording what their computer is hearing. So the sound becomes very, very clean. Nice. Uh, and and I would recommend that you they, they do have a free version for that, but if you have more than so many users or something on there, you do have to pay for it. Yeah, we've also discovered that's very helpful when we're trying to invite a guest on or somebody who just doesn't want to use Skype. Uh, mm -hmm. But the as, as I understand that the only condition with Zencaster is that you have to have Chrome or Firefox. Yes, uh, that is true. Uh, and that doesn't seem to be a problem when you when I'm, when I'm talking to somebody who's very low tech, uh, <laughs> they tend to know what their browser is more than they want to try to learn Skype. So, so Zencaster is, is pretty helpful for somebody who basically just knows how to answer the phone. I will also add a new app that I just found this week. Um, lot, two weeks ago, actually, it's an app called Headliner. And it, it's really cool because um, I, when we have new episodes, I post uh, to our social channels like Instagram, Twitter, things like that. And Headliner allows you to create, it's like a video with audio. So it'll be whatever our picture we're using for that episode, I can put that in the app and then I can take a clip of our audio from the episode and it'll make a little video out of it. So then instead of just seeing a picture from the, um, from the ep from whatever the episode is, they can actually play a clip of the interview on Instagram. So it can, I don't know, it like works to like entice them to want to go finish hearing what the episode is about. So that's called Headliner. It allows you to do, I think five videos a month for free, um, which is wow. pretty cool. I'm really, cause I, and it looks something like this, like when you, I don't know if you guys can see it. Uh, yeah. It's like has a little play button and the oh. little sound, the audio thing. Um, so that was something I've been trying to figure out how to do for years and just was too lazy to try to figure it out. So this app is called Headliner. I thought that was a pretty cool discovery. 
And uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think I have any. Oh, and I just wanted to also say, um, get if you're in terms of promoting, I know that was a big thing with us. We didn't, we're like, how do we let people know? Social media was really helpful for that. And when it came to that, it, it was more about like building relationships with the people you want to be your listeners rather than going and say, listen to my podcast. I just went and I was like, oh, who are all these horror book lovers on Instagram? And I started following them and interacting with them. And then just naturally started to find ways to say, oh my gosh, we just did an episode on this book or, um, you know, things like that. And in the beginning, it was really like boots on the ground. Every single, we earned like one listener at a time, <laughs> um, just by making friends with people that, that were interested in the same subject. And then, mm -hmm. and then it kind of snowballed from there. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I would say if you're, if you're thinking about promoting in that way, genuine connection is the way to go. And also if you can, build connections with other podcasts in your, yes. in your same genre. Um, yeah. That was huge. We made friends with all the other horror podcasts. So now we're kind of like this big, huge horror podcast network instead of competing shows. Yeah. And we've all cross pollinated and been on each other's shows. And um, that has also been huge for building our audience as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's been great for um, uh, book promotion too, because everybody writes when they're up, when uh, they have their podcasts as well for like in, in our community anyway. And so when someone has a book come out, we can say, Hey, friends, A, B, and C on all of the different podcasts. Like, can I go be on your podcast? And then you can be on mine when your book comes out in summer. And so it's actually worked really well for that as well. We are coming up. I think we have uh, less than five minutes left. So if anyone in the in the uh, attendees wants to ask a question, please populate it in the Q and A. And uh, otherwise, I will keep going. Um, I, I put the oh. I, uh, Michael. I put the, the the four shows or the four services that we were just talking about in the chat. So oh, if you excellent. didn't know Headliner or Anchor or Podbean or Libsyn, you will now have links to them. Just copy the chat down. Plus, everybody else has put their own data in that link. So that's another way to gather this information for your later analysis. Because I'm a believer that, you know, every time you do anything, you should be gathering information to improve what you do. So yeah. that's why I put those in there. <laughs> Good call. Excellent. <laughs> Um, and then, yeah, to like wrap it up, I don't know, uh, have you, have you, uh, any of you managed to monetize? I know you were just talking about getting sponsors, um, to help. I, I have like a, a Patreon that, um, well, it's inactive right now because of the whole pandemic, but, but it didn't, it didn't bring me a lot of money, but it paid for Libsyn and <laughs> Zencaster <laughs> and stuff like that. It just, you know, was like a, a couple of dollars that, that balanced out so I broke even. Yep. That's yes. what we have. We we didn't actually start the Patreon until we had been a podcast for a year because we didn't want to just come out right away and say, join this thing when you have no idea who we are. But we did start one and we have it, like you said, enough supporters that we um it's not paying our bills or anything, but it is paying for our website, our Libsyn hosting. Um anytime we need to do something a little extra for the show, if we need equipment here and there. So nothing um, to break the bank, but it's it helps. And uh, we've also had a couple of sponsorships, nothing major either, but um, probably about three different sponsorships. So whenever we get that, we just throw it into our podcast PayPal and use it for basically to keep the show running so that it doesn't come out of our pocket. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> a podcast will come out of your pocket in the beginning. Um, so that's another reason to be really make sure it's something you want to do and be passionate about what you're talking about because it it but it is it's you're also creating a platform for yourself so um if you if you do it it, it does um it's it's a it's a great thing to do we love it it's it's just it's work and it you have to love it <laughs> yep. yeah. yeah um Hold on, I just oh, uh, I accidentally oh. clicked off the window. So I was like, ah, I don't know what <laughs> happened. Um, does anyone out there have any questions you want to ask real quick before we wrap up? 
doesn't look like people had a lot of questions. I think people <laughs> wanted to know. Mm -hmm. They didn't yeah. want to ask any questions. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know. So they wanted to hear from people who are already there getting dirty, getting muddy. <laughs> what, yeah. What's it look like? Why should I do this? Why are we involved in this? And whether it can work for them? The answer is podcasting is great if you can make it work, if you can yeah. be passionate about it, if you can be focused about it, if you can dedicate yourself to doing something meaningful and organizing it in a way that benefits you, then it can be a viable means of communicating with an audience, with your friends, with your family, with new people you get to meet. And I think that ultimately that's great. And someone says, why podcast over a YouTube channel? Mm. Mm, that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, my answer to that would be because a lot of people find stuff on YouTube instead of through, although that may change with Joe Rogan going over to Spotify. Um, but a lot of people find stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of video blogs on YouTube and stuff like that. And uh, it's, it's no... It's no greater effort to publish to YouTube when you're publishing to these other platforms. You just, I know with Libsyn, you just type, hit YouTube and it sends it to YouTube. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's I think one of the things that, I mean, when I, when I, I, when I saw the title for this panel in the program, which was what podcasting is the future of fantasy or something like that. I thought mm -hmm. that's an intimidating title to try to live up to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But what it made me think is that pod, there, there's so many different kinds of podcasts. You mentioned the, uh, the Lovecraft dramatization, for example. There are people reading fiction. There are people talking about fiction. There are people reviewing. There are video podcasts. I think podcasts are so much at the beginning of, of that technology that we don't really know what they're going to look like in 10 or 20 years. I mean, if, if we were at the World Fantasy Convention in, in 1450 and there were a panel discussion like this, it would probably be called The Book. Is it a good idea? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think that is all of our time. So thank you very much for participating and thank you everybody for for uh, watching. And uh we'll have this content recorded so everyone can glean all the good advice that was passed around <laughs> and everything. It'll be great. Uh so thank you very, very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. having us. Bye. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye now. <laughs>